As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of, fo- number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs who have never born, and the breasts that have never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, he saved others, yet he saved, he, to let him save himself, if he's the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you and I are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the land until the ninth hour. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. What we're we'll looking at here. Crucifixion, the means of fear. You know, at one point in Julius Caesar's life, in his political career, feelings were running so high against him in Rome that he decided that he would leave for a while and he, he sailed for the Aegean island of Rhodes. And en route, his ship was attacked by pirates and he was captured. And the pirates took him, captured him, and demanded a ransom of 12,000 gold pieces. And he sent his men and his officials away with him to go and collect the money. And throughout his 40 days captivity, Julius Caesar got to know these people. Apparently he was a man who, who could really lead men. And he actually got inside with these pirates and he started talking. And he used to joke with them. He said, you know, when I'm released, I'm going to hunt you down and I'm going to crucify every one of you. And they all thought it was a great joke. Well, 40 days later, um, his men came back, they paid the ransom, and Julius Caesar was duly freed. The first thing he did was set up a fleet. He found the pirates, he caught them, and he executed every single one of them to the last man. Such was the Romans' attitude towards crucifixion. It was to be reserved for the worst of criminals, And it was a means of showing extreme contempt for the condemned. See, the suffering and humiliation of Roman crucifixion was just unequaled, and it still is. Probably the most powerful torture known to man. People are funny people. Funny, aren't they, really? I don't know about you, but the folk I meet never cease to amaze me. You know, when I go to the shop and I see Easter eggs everywhere and everyone's sort of away with the pink and fluffy sort of image of Easter, aren't they? The main area of fascination for me as I meet people, though, is the way that people view themselves in comparison to God. And I suppose Julius Caesar in an extreme is a fine example of that. There are many people in the world who say there's no God. But I think they're in the minority, actually. 
I think the majority of people do believe in God, but they find all sorts of convenient ways to avoid the question of Jesus. You know, does he really need to be my saviour? Does he really need to be Lord of my life? In fact, the church is full of folk like that. Folk who, want, who will say the, the prayer and accept Jesus into their life. But when it comes to actual discipleship, well, actually, that's probably a little bit a step too far. You see, people's, if we injected some in honesty in the mix there, I don't think folk would have a problem. I don't think folk have a problem with Jesus because he claimed to be God incarnate. I don't think people have a problem with that. I don't think it's a, re a rejection of what he's done for them on the cross. I don't think that's an issue for them either. The difficulty would seem to be that people honestly believe that humanity is essentially good. And to hold that intention with a God who is meant to be love on the one hand, but who is going to judge us on the other hand, seems to be a bit of a contradiction. It's almost a bridge too far for them. Some would even go so far as to say that God is cruel and actually out of touch with the real world. Whereas humanity has all the qualities of compassion and love and is able to realise incredible potential because actually we're here now. God is invisible. So, you know, we don't really see him working, do we? So it's down to us. The fact is, you see, that this kind of doctrine is very popular and it's sold via the soft sell through the media. <coughs> And the message is that human beings are intrinsically good and any deviation, be that perverse or any other kind of antisocial behaviour, can actually be accounted for by a sociological conditioning of some kind or another. You know the kind of thing, well, you know, it comes from a poor background. Or, did, did you know his, his dad had been in prison? Any excuse is given rather than look at the cause that is the reason that the world is in a state that's in the reason why folk are greedy and unkind. The, we, the reason why finding integrity in politics is like trying to find the Holy Grail. The reason why common courtesy is becoming a thing of the past. You know, it's no good blaming God if you think like this. You can't blame God for war and abuse and poverty and disease. It's no use in making any complaint. And journalists should take particular note if they're watching this video. If the God is all-seeing and God is all-knowing, why is there so much suffering in the world? And what about those who have never heard the gospel of Jesus? Because although they are valid questions, if we really believe that humanity has the capacity for good, and that would have to be to the point of perfection, considering the state of the world, then why would you be complaining about God in the first place? The issue here is that God cannot be controlled and God cannot be moulded to shape that we want and the standards that we want and here in the scriptures that we've read this morning we see the culmination of this folly as the son of god is arrested as he's taken illegally to trial as he's falsely sentenced as he is flogged and then as he is crucified why because they thought they were dispensing with a problem and they and they, in this case, are the Jewish authorities, thought that their plan was working out just fine. Turn with me to John chapter 12, just for a minute, and you get a picture of the way things were. John chapter 12 and verse 9. Now, this is the point just after Lazarus had been raised from the dead. Jesus is meeting at Simon's house, and they're having a dinner, okay? And look at the response. Jesus is clearly causing a stir, a stir, and I wish we could talk about Lazarus today, but we ain't got time. It says, verse 9, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, who had raised from the dead. So the chief police, priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Elsewhere it says, if he continues on like this, you know, the whole world will follow him. Well, why didn't they get it then? You see, they were too concentrating on themselves, you see. Too many are not interested in answers to the questions of life. They're only seeking this sense of approval to believe and behave in the way that you want to. And in our world of civil liberties and human rights, well, you know, that sounds reasonable. But if you would be a Christian then one has to realise that life and existence is not about individual opinion. 
It's about a sensitivity to God the Holy Spirit and a realistic estimation of your imperfection, which actually, which actually, as time goes on, intensifies our constant need for God's forgiveness and his cleansing in our lives. If any progress is to be made on us individually and if any impression is going to be made on the society in which we live. You know, it's a bit what they say about children. You know, children are like wet cement. Whatever falls on them makes an impression. <laughs> this, of course, is an assault, you see. It's an assault on our pride. It's an assault on our self-sufficiency and, of course, on our own self-determination as to what we think the will of God really is. Remember earlier I said about Chris, you know, when I called, good morning, Chris. And he... We often do that, but instead of just... Actually, what he did was very interesting. He, he looked around for a while, and then he stopped. And then he, I saw him do it and said, hang on, stop a minute, I can't sit. And he listened again, and I said, morning, Chris. And he thought, that came sort of that direction, and he started looking around, and he found me. Mm. Often when God speaks to us like that, he says, good morning, or hello, or I'm speaking. We go, like that. And he says it again, and we keep doing this all the time. And we say, oh, it must have been over there. I can't see anything, but it must be over there. And off we go. Instead of waiting and looking and finding him for ourselves. But you see, this fantasy, that as human beings, we're in some way superior and good and kind, can be, and can determine our own destiny, is shown here for exactly what it is. It is absolute folly. And we've got examples of folly up and down the country. You know, I used to love walking to different follies, you know, on different tops of different hills. I think of one in Russia called Firish. And, and it's a great sort of arches and things, a, a lovely walk as well. But actually, that was built because there was quite a lot of unemployment in the area. So landowners who wanted to do a good thing, and it was a good thing, they actually paid men, men locally so they would have some self-worth and a wage to carry these enormous rocks up the hill and build this folly in the name of the landowner, of course. So they were doing something good, but they were glorifying themselves. But it's a folly. It means nothing. It's a monument to nothing, because I don't know who the bloke was who, who paid them in the first place. Do you know him? What does Paul say? For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved come on it's the power. power of God yeah you should know that it should be burned into your soul see being fully man it would have been understandable for Jesus in these circumstances to act a little bit out of character maybe even to act in some kind of self-preservation but instead revealing God and man as they really are or as they're really meant to be Jesus continued fully in character he followed the Father's will, and going to the cross was clearly his priority. But have you ever thought how hard it must have been? Mm -hmm. Loving these people who you know are going to murder you. Mm -hmm. Murder you for no other reason than doing God's <laughs> will. For preaching good news to the poor. Fulfilling the scripture. Healing the sick. Raising the dead. You know, I'm sure the CPS would have a few questions about that if they went to court. But the crowd, they just watched. The world just watches. You see, crucifixion and torment of the local population was a common sight in Jerusalem. It was a busy place. It was crowded with people going about their business and parading criminals in a public way. This was just a deterrent and a reminder to everyone that Roman justice cannot be escaped. And as such, folk were caught up in the moment whether they liked it or not. And of course, Jesus was an innocent and of course, there's a lot of press in that situation. And so no one likes injustice or so they say. And so there would have been a big crowd, a lot of sympathizers. Maybe they're shouting encouragement to him along the road. Maybe they're promising prayer. Maybe they're even apologizing that they felt powerless to do anything. And from a human perspective, Jesus needed that support. People need people, you know. You know, I read a lovely little story about a young girl who 
Her mum had sent her up and said, go and get yourself undressed for bed, darling. And up she went. And the little girl says, mum, would you come and help me? And she says, no, no, you, you know how to undress yourself. Yes, yeah, she says, but sometimes people need people anyway, even if they do know how th to do things themselves. <laughs> she just wanted her mum there. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus wanted Jesus needed, Jesus desired love and support, even when he's in control. And in this moment, this moment when he just feels he can't go on anymore, and I don't know if you've been physically to one of those places, and there's not another breath in you. He just wants help, but he's alone. You know, there's five groups of people mentioned in this passage. And Luke mentions uniquely four of them one of them is mentioned in mark's gospel the first of course is simon of cyrene and he's also mentioned in mark chapter 15. then there were the women then there was the two men the sentenced to die at the same time then there was the crowd and then there was a centurion look at verse 26 as they led him away they see simon from cyrene who was on his way from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women for, who were mourning for him. <coughs> Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green... What will happen when it's dry? A large group of people followed him. Now this helps us to set the scene a little bit of just how busy a place this was. As the accused are being paraded around the streets, a long way to the cross. And I don't think it stretches the imagination too much to consider, for example, Acts chapter 2. Look at Acts chapter 2 with me just now, and verse 5. This is the time of Pentecost, which gives us a real good illustration of the kind of mix of people that would have been there for all kinds of reasons. Now, I know this is a few weeks later, but if we read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews, from every nation under heaven. And then on to verse 9, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, and Cretans and Arabs. That's 15 nations on this day the most significant day in history the crowd are moving all in one direction towards Golgotha where the place of the cross but at least one man is going in the opposite direction Simon of Cyrene who was on his way in from the country even in the midst of this horrific scene some might see the romanticism of this and say Oh, well, God is at work here. Well, we can't doubt that. God did work that day. But in reality, what we've got here is an ordinary guy going about his business. And as he gets level with Jesus, Jesus falls. And to the Roman soldiers, this is a bit of a pain because the longer it takes, the longer the shift's going to be. Come on, get up. Come on, get up. And he won't move. And then they see this guy. Now, remember, the crowd is moving this direction. Simon's walking in this direction. And they say, you, cross now. What's he going to do? I know he would have said nowadays. Huh, who are you talking to? He wouldn't have said that at all. Not with Roman soldiers. I'm sure he was scared, you know. He probably felt victimised and he probably wanted no association at all with the convicted criminal because the Romans were so unpredictable and fear was the order of the day. So he just did as he was told and everyone else was just glad it wasn't them. So don't romanticise this, folks. Don't start spiritualising. The fact is, ordinary people are being caught up in this scene. Now, we know for a fact that actually he was affected by that, but the, fact, the point is... He was an ordinary guy going about his business. And that's always the way. There you are, minding your own business, happy in your routine, and something or someone happens. And life is about to change. And regardless of how you feel, there's nothing you can do to do anything about it. You know your life is going in a direction. You know you've got to go there. Now, what you can do 
is you can decide. You can decide to rise to the occasion. You can decide whether whether you're going to be a victim or whether you're going to see this as an opportunity. See, they watched. Simon was commandeered. And then, of course, we got the women. Now, to understand the verses of these women weeping and Jesus speaking to them, we've got to backtrack a little bit. Let's go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and verse 41. Let me read this to you. This is Palm Sunday, which is actually today, Palm Sunday, but we are a bit ahead of ourselves. So <clears throat> Jesus is looking at Jerusalem, and as he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, and he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. Incredible, the future destruction of Jerusalem he's talking about. That's what had caused him to weep on his way into Jerusalem. And it was the same destruction over which the women of Jerusalem are now told to weep. These women, he's saying, don't weep for me. After all, my death is going to be the cause of your salvation. What you should mourn over is the destruction that's going to come on you and your children. Now, for us looking back, we know that historically, 10 years later, that destruction was brought on the city and its inhabitants by, by Titus in AD 70. And it was a bloody occasion. Thousands were executed. And we have to consider as well that these words of prophecy will come true. And they're viewed by the commentators actually as a judgment on the Jews for rejecting the Messiah. Although he's still their Messiah. And now it's been with us, along with us. Even to this point, in this terrible journey, folk are given an opportunity to see what is happening, to turn from their wicked way, to accept Jesus as the promised Messiah. There's opportunity to show some moral courage and stand with him, even to death if necessary, but no. Even when there's a message being sent that, that the response will come from the Gentile or the non-Jewish world, look at the link. As he falls, a Gentile was called to carry his cross in his suffering. And then he speaks to the women and he talks about a Gentile army that will actually come and destroy Jerusalem. And we're back to where we started all over again. Here's that assault. Jesus is an assault on the Jewish authorities' pride. He's an assault on their self-sufficiency and of course he's an assault on their self-determination as to what they thought the will of God is or was. You know, crucifixion, it was never an execution method of the Jews, never. And at this time in history, it wasn't as common as we're led to believe, did you know that? But I'll tell you something, when Titus sacked Jerusalem... So many people were crucified, they ran out of wood for the crosses. We think we're suffering, we think we have it tough. So you see, the prophetic picture here is that if you don't act to God's revelation now, it will lead to something just as terrible. But this one man sentenced to death because of pride is just the tip of the iceberg of what is to come. But I want you to take note in the midst of that horror, Jesus' demeanour in all of this. He doesn't think for himself. He doesn't think about getting a drink and saying, oh, he gives a drink. He doesn't say that, does he? No. He speaks to those who will suffer. And he says, pray. You see, pop contrary to popular belief, unbelieving humanity is self-centred and it's cruel and it will do everything necessary for survival. The godlike qualities of love and compassion, they only find their meaning, their true meaning, in relationship with Jesus Christ. See, and they watched. Simon was commandeered. The women, they wept. 
Then there's a cross and a crowd. Look at verse 32 with me. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place of the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, <coughs> one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, ha, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar. And they said to him, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Then there was a written notice above him which said, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there just hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now, I'm sure there's many things spoken by dying men hanging on a cross. And I don't doubt that the name of God was a common on their, on their lips as they knew that they were going to die very soon. Their mortality was just painfully stark. But I think it's interesting that Jesus prays for forgiveness in the first instance for all those present caught up in this moment and going along with the crowd. Because as a result, they were just participants in the rejection of him as Messiah. And by not making the decision for Jesus Christ, you know, you're just the same as them. By not choosing him, you decide against him. You're either in or you're out. The reason, of course, was their ignorance. And it's no excuse, of course, but that's the reason. They knew who Jesus said he was. And I suppose it was easy for them just to get rid of the problem rather than face up to the possibilities because there might be a change. A fear we've seen before is an emotion that just destabilizes everything and it causes folk to, to retreat into themselves. It causes others to act out of character. Look what happened. The people watching, they're watching an execution. This is an awful sight. You know, crucifixion, when they hang someone on the cross, whether it's with their hands or the wrist, they tie them up and then they stand them on the little plinth. And when they stand them on the plinth for a while, so they've got some kind of rest and they can push themselves out so they can breathe. Because if you're, if you're hanging, it asphyxiates you. And then what they would do, would they come around eventually and they would break your legs so that you would just hang and then you would suffocate. How horrific is that? Now bear in mind also that he'd been scourged. So the scourge is like a, a great big whip with all these, all these tails in it and it's got shards of glass and metal. So every time it was whipped across someone's back, it actually tore out a lump of flesh as well. Now think of what it's like when you fall over. Poor Beyonce. Okay, falling over, hurt your knee, you've got a scab on your knee. What do you do? You pick it, don't you? Hands up if you're a picker. Yeah, come on, hands up. Okay, okay. So we all know. And we know what it's like. It's really sore, isn't it? Imagine great welts across your back, sometimes that long, still bleeding. And people watched. The rulers of the people who should be appalled because their, their job as stewards of the people is to see peace. And they're enjoying this and they sneered at him. And the soldiers, well, they just thought it was a bit of a laugh, you know. They've even put up a sign, the king of the Jews, going to see you. See these Jews, they're a bunch of wallies, aren't they? Look, here it goes. That's how strong you are. And even the criminal on one of his sides insulted him. Now, some might say, well, that's just normal behaviour, isn't it? And I suppose from a distance from an armchair, when we, we talk about someone else, it's easy for us to come to that conclusion. But this behaviour is not right. It's not right. How can anyone watch someone die, anything die? It's bad enough having your dog put down, isn't it? But seeing a human being die, being tortured, being bleeding, I just can't, it's just beyond imagination. But this behaviour is not right, even if the man suffering next to him, he just slanders him. I can't believe that he did that. But you know what he was doing? He was just saying what everyone else, everyone else wanted to. You're no better than us, Jesus. Look at you now. Bleeding. Choking. Look at you. You're naked in front of everyone. 
See, all your grand words mean nothing here. Look, where's your, where's your followers, Jesus? Come on, where are they? You're on your own, Jesus. You're the same as us. Come on, prove us all wrong. Get us out of this. Get me off the cross now. See, fear again. It's a fear that feels it's missing out. Fear that we might not be as good as we think we are. Fear that if life changes, then we won't be in control. And then, in the midst of the darkness and the hopelessness, two men see the truth of the situation and they speak out. It's like a, a spotlight coming into the midst of this. Look at verse 40 to 43. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We're being punished justly and we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth today, you'll be with me in paradise. What was Jesus guilty of? Answer me. Cruelty? I can't hear you. No. Hate? No. Slander? Come on louder. No. 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 Lies? No. Compassion? Yes. Love? Yes. Self-sacrifice? Yes. Forgiving? Yes. It was about the sixth hour. And darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun had stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Job done. And Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man, or surely this was the Son of God elsewhere. When all the people were gathered to witness this, they saw it take place. They beat their breasts and they went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The tide, the rush on which everyone is being carried along and they come through the town. They've seen him fall. They've seen him scourged. They've seen him punished. They've seen all the people pulled into this situation. Poor old Simon's been pulled in. The women are crying. There's all this noise and suddenly it stops. They beat their breasts. What have we done? And they left. Let's pray. Our Father, this passion time, it's hard not to get passionate because we understand the sacrifice that you made to an extent. And as we experience the benefits of that, we do bless you. And we know that there's 10,000 reasons and then more for the fact that we should call you our Lord and our Saviour. We thank you for the challenge that it is to our heart and we pray that you'd help us to consider these things. To not just stand at a distance, but to be there at the foot of your cross, willing to serve and to willing to carry it if necessary. Help us never to miss your voice or your promises, but help us to hear and to see so that we can be called, rightly called the children of God. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.